Hey 3DMJers, this is Andrea Valdez, and you're listening to the 3D Muscle Journey Podcast. Today, we're bringing you a conversation about how the heck to handle yourself when injury happens, when pain sets in, or when returning to lifting after any other type of layoff. We have physical therapist Nick Licamelli, Chief Science Officer Eric Helms, and one of our head physique coaches, Jeff Alberts, all here on the podcast to tell you all about it. Eric and Jeff will be sharing some of their most recent struggles through pain, injury, and aging while learning and discussing these tools and methods that Nick and other professionals use to keep athletes happy and progressing. You'll learn about workload management, the envelope of function, how stress affects our physiology, when to give up on a specific exercise or movement, why pain doesn't always come from injuries, and a whole lot more. As always, if you have any feedback or comments on this episode, go to 3dmusclejourney.com or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash team3dmj. Leave it under podcast number 161. Let's go ahead and dive in. Here is Principles of Injury Reduction and Management with Nick Licamelli, Jeff Alberts, and Eric Helms. So I am happy to be here with you, Dr. Licamelli, PT, DPT, uh, and also Jeff Alberts, uh, the, the, the godfather himself, um, because I think we are starting to finally see a renaissance of perspective change among lifters who are uh, injured, um, in so much as even understanding what an injury is 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 changing for the better i would argue and our reaction to it i think has become uh different i know a little personal anecdote when i would previously get hurt i felt like i was quote unquote breaking the rules when i tried to train around it uh, or figure out what i could do instead of taking time off and resting it like you know a good reasonable lifter would Um, and now I think after being exposed to your work, Nick, and others, I've come to understand that there is a significant issue with dealing with injury and then also dealing with detraining. And it comes down to, what would you call it, load management, Nick? Yep, workload management. Mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I I think think this is is a, a, Ken has the potential to be a very useful conversation in that Jeff and I can share our personal experiences, our coaching experiences, we can help um you know give some real life examples to some of the theoretical concepts that that you'll have and also of course you have a ton of experience as a pt so i think what might be helpful is to open this up with what is an injury great question uh so thank you (laughs) so the here's the thing with injury is it seems like it's simple like if if you know what an injury is everyone knows what an injury is but if you try to define it it's actually not so simple because there's a, a wide spectrum of, of things that we can fit into this injury category. So you can have, you know, is it just pain? Well, I've had pain sometimes when I wake up in the morning and take a couple, couple steps and it goes away. But is that an injury? Um, mm. Does that mean tissue damage? And we'll kind of get into that a little bit. But usually something, you know, not always tissue damage is involved. Does it mean time off? from training does it mean if you're a field sport athlete it's time off from practice does it only uh you know is it only an injury if you go see a healthcare provider is it only an injury if you go to your trainer uh for your team so all of these questions kind of make the definition of injury hard and i think that's why it's even harder to nail down like the five easy steps to prevent injury because like pain in and of itself injury is kind of murky and multifactorial and hard to define Mm -hmm. so we're not going to get a definition of injury are we we're just gonna (laughs) (laughs) all i've learned is it's it's uh it's, it's it's murky and we can't boil it down to five easy steps so I'm thinking maybe what, like seven easy steps? That's almost a 50% increase. Right? Yeah, I figure we'll go with seven now, and then maybe I'll okay. come out with an updated version someday with the five tips, and, uh, and we'll got to kind of go, go from there. Got a graded exposure approach. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> to, to more steps. Um, I agree. <laughs> 
<laughs> so basically, uh, how do we how do we how do we manage this thing that we can't really nail down? And I think before we get into this, what's what I want to start with is the difference between principles and the difference between techniques or or tactics. And basically, mm-hmm. principles are things that are are universal, um, self evident, always present in everything that we do. So an example I like to use is if you're building something and and, uh, you turn the screw to the right, it goes in, you turn the screw to the left, it comes out. No matter how you go about building whatever you're building, those principles are going to be at the foundation of any kind of technique that you choose. When it comes to injury, what I like to view as the principles are this concept of like workload management. And if you imagine like a seesaw almost of load and capacity and load would be the actual load that we put onto our body. So it's, you know, weight lifted, it's sets completed, it's frequency during the week, it's step count, it's, um, amount of hours that you're playing a sport. It's if you helped your friend move furniture over the weekend. Those are all things that go into load. And then capacity is our ability to recover from that. And that includes things Mm -hmm. like sleep quality, nutrition, hydration, um, stress, anxiety, those type of things can decrease capacity. Um, Also things like, uh, so the more that you train, the more capacity you will build, right? So these things are the the two are in constant kind of um, they affect each other. Uh, so we right. want to push we want to push load uh, so that capacity adapts to it, um, but we don't want to push it too far. That's a pretty mm-hmm. good intro, I think, good place to start, and then maybe we can kind of dive into some specifics in you know a little bit. It's a perfect entry point, I would say. Um, <laughs> and actually, <clears throat> Jeff, this I think is something that shouldn't be too unfamiliar to a lot of the ways that we help our audience conceptualize training. You always talk about supply and demand, you know, and you use that as a conceptual framework to help people understand what is an appropriate amount of training stress to put on their bodies based on what else is going on in their life. And that's kind of how we integrate, you know, bodybuilding into someone's total life. It's that interdependence of recovery and stimulus. Um, And, I think that framework has helped a lot of our audience get around some of the common pitfalls. Like, oh my God, I'm, I'm on prep. I'm in a calorie deficit, so I'm more likely to lose muscle. So I don't want to deload. I need to keep the stimulus high. When you go, hold on, hold on. Let's think logically. We actually need to balance supply and demand or uh, you know, recovery and, and stress or, or workload management like Nick talked about. These are all the same concepts. So, so Jeff... This sounds like something that you already think of, but do you think about it in terms of injury risk or injury susceptibility, or is it more just in terms in your in your head more about just the the adaptive process of training? I think you hit the nail on the head when I kind of conceptualize everything I do bodybuilding related and even life related. It's there's always going to be some type of demand, and there that you always have to have some type of recovery capacity. So that's, that's kind of the framework I'm always thinking about. And I think now that I've kind of seen Nick's work, it's made me think more about, like, I think harder about things I'm applying to people ahead of time. It's like, how, okay, if I do this, what's going to be the consequence? Is it going to be a positive or a negative outcome? And of course, you don't truly know until you actually apply something, but it's basically opened my mind to the concept like a a little more grand, a little more bigger perspective, like big picture perspective. And it's for me, it's easier to apply to others than it is, let's say myself, as you kind of well aware, Eric, since you have programmed the last couple of box for me. But yeah, it's like, that's basically what I talked about on my last vlog was the supply and demand. And I, and I gave a lot of context as to what's led up to my current status of a little bit of aches and pains is because the overall demand escalated over time. And I wasn't fully understanding that while it was happening, it wasn't, you know, now like I look in hindsight, I go, okay, coming off of a contest prep where I was in more of a depleted state, low body fat levels, 
you know, food level really low that, you know, I knew better at the time, like, okay, let's not increase the overall workload. So I, I kind of figured, okay, not a smart time to overhaul training, to add a bunch of volume at this time. Let me recover. Let me gain some body weight back. Let me increase food level. Naturally, by doing that, I already realized that my performance was going to elevate through like the, my ability to increase loads, my ability to increase reps. So I knew that that was going to be an overall demand right there. So to let's say, hey, let's throw a bunch of sets on top of that, or let's add in a bunch of exercises or overhaul my whole training program, increasing frequency and things like that, that my demand was definitely going to far outpace my ability to recover. So long story short, you know, I, I was smart in the beginning, but as the months unfolded, not only did my performance keep elevating, but in a sense, I was actually increasing sets here and there. And, you know, lifting so much in a depleted state, gradually increasing the load, getting to the later stages, like even while loads, let's say, were kind of getting capped a little bit, it's still like the demand was still there. Like you're still lifting the same heavier loads over and over and over again. And it eventually just caught up to me. And mm. basically that's when I started to notice like a lot of these aches and pains creeping in. And I wouldn't like, I don't even know what injury means now after listening to Nick <laughs> in the beginning stages. So I, I don't, it's not necessarily like injury as an acute injury, but more like these, these repetitive use things were kind of starting to creep in. Personally, I've experienced, I don't know, maybe Nick can tell me if this is an injury or not. I tore my calf back in 2013. Like that was something that acutely happened. He's like, kind of like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, so anyway, long story short is it's just... All in your head. In, a, <laughs> in a sense, my personal experiences over the last six, seven months, it kind of just really cemented it in my brain. I need to pay closer attention to how everything is, like the overall demand, how that's going to impact either positively or negatively. And like I always talk about, to, to balance things out, like there's periods where you have to overreach because as a bodybuilder, powerlifter, we have to overload in order to create, you know, more progress. But at the same time, there is going to be a price to pay for that. You mm. have to balance it out. And I think that's what I've gotten a little bit more intelligent about, you know, the last last few years, but really the last six, seven months, even on a broader scale. That's a really great real world perspective of some of these concepts and jeff when it, when you tore your calf did you try meditating because it could help you know the biopsychosocial model of pain maybe it was more because you were stressed about your calf not being attached anymore uh me meditate at the time <laughs> no in the other words you said uh no <laughs> <laughs> No, um, so like basically when that happened, I just remember my instant thought was, why me? And it was like, how did this happen? Why did it happen? And it took me a good few hours to kind of calm myself down, talked with Alberto a little bit. And he's like, hey, let's don't focus on the negative, focus on the positive. So I flipped the switch. I was like, okay, let me take this opportunity as a learning experience to go through this and try to use this experience to, to help others in the same predicament. So, and, and I didn't stop training like I did was I basically, I altered my lower body training. So I was like, okay, I wasn't focusing on what I can't do. I was focusing on what I can do. So there were still a few exercises I could still do as long as I had my foot in, in certain positions. Yeah. And that is, that's basically what I try to preach every single day that I do anything with this stuff because it, the problem is I think when people don't have an Alberto like you had and they're just left to their own thoughts and they're that, that those negative thoughts that kind of just spiral and get worse and worse and then Dr. Google tells them something and then they you know their their friend of a friend tells them something and and I think it's so important to have that support um, structure there to kind of uh, you know, reassure you and help you focus on the positive because that is basically, you know, that's the name of the game right there. It's, it's, this happened. What are we going to do now? And how are we going to keep training? How are we not going to make this worse? How are we going to let mother nature do her thing and, and, you know, kind of work this thing out? I think you had a great point when you said that most of the time these things kind of creep up. It's not always like a bang, like that moment, that's when it happened. And that's, um, 
that's why it's 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 so important to be aware of this stuff and um we 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 kind of we we get what we train so to speak so as as we if we are for example uh, you know a, a bodybuilder and we're doing a certain amount of load a certain amount of basic repetition range we're going to have some sort of of protection within that type of training but then if we spike the load or, or we, we do a different activity um, you know whether it be powerlifting or we play basketball one day or we go for a 10 mile hike or something then those are the things that are going to really kind of push us past that um, but uh, but no yeah I think most of the time it's it's we we don't really consider it too much because it is this like insidious onset of of these aches and pains and then we really don't know if we don't know what to do or what to make of them just yet they end up kind of escalating into these more long-term things load management is essentially what you're talking what you're both talking about and i think it's a really it's an interesting topic because at least for me, and I don't want to speak for Jeff, but I imagine probably similarly for him, it's something that we, we get in our field. So the idea of load management is something that Alberto, Jeff, Brad, and myself, especially when I was working with a lot more athlete, fully understand in the context of prep. You know, when someone says, oh, we're going to be moving, or oh, my, my loved one died, or, oh, I've, I've got uh, this, this crazy new work shift. Or, oh, I've got my medical exams. And these are all real examples of things that have happened with our clients. We know that the likelihood of them binging on their diet, having an emotional breakdown, wanting to quit, or getting injured or getting sick is high. And we know that purely from having seen hundreds of people go through the process and understanding that life doesn't stop for bodybuilding. So there does seem to be some type of total, what we call in science, allostatic load like your total capacity to handle stress holistically. And in my field, as a, you know, those who don't know, I did my PhD in auto regulation, which is kind of has elements of this embedded in periodization and training. Um, a big kind of, like I said before, renaissance uh, of this literature is our, our, our more advanced understanding of, of the more holistic aspect of periodization. So kind of the old model based on old stress data and old stress research was one that was very reductionist. So we would see things as saying, hey, you know, our input is what's on the Excel spreadsheet. And we live in a physical world, you have physical adaptations, not considering that, you know, hormones, emotional response, psychology is also at the very smallest level, physical things happening that are real in the body, you know. Um, and not kind of, and kind of having this disconnected idea of what happens in the weight room, that stress doesn't count or compared to or is affected by. It is this independent factor compared to everything else that's going on in your life. We know that's not true in contest prep. And I would say that any modern sports scientist who's worth their salt understands that you can't have that completely separate. And now we've had this whole change in perspective. Um, and it's not just in the science world. I would say there's a lot of really savvy practitioners. Mike T, Mike Tashir, uh, the guy who started RP in powerlifting, has a great analogy um, where, you know, he talks about how if the stress or the training stress you're putting on someone is turning on that faucet, if we kind of look at ourselves as this reductionist mechanical model, your recovery capacity is how big is your drain and how deep is your sink before it starts overflowing. But the reality is, and what you're talking about, Nick, is that as you turn that faucet on more and more and more, you actually get a, a taller sink and you get an expanded faucet. So if there's not a fixed amount that you can handle or rec can recover from, but those things slowly adapt. But if you try to put a fire hose in there, it doesn't matter how quickly you adapt. There's two gallons of water in there in about five seconds, and that's when you have a problem. So I think it's it's been really helpful for me to kind of just take the same knowledge and perspective I have in periodization. And I know that the coaches have looking at, at contest prep and go, hey, guess what? That applies to injury as well. You know, your ability to like, I mean, we have a lot of data on it, too. Uh, injuries happen more often in fatigued athletes. You know, the motor, motor learning goes down a little bit. We see college athletes during exams suffer more injuries on the field. There's just repeated examples of this. So I think it's just a really interesting 
um, thing that we already knew, but is now starting to take more hold and understanding in our kind of cultural knowledge uh, as applied to injury. Can I give you a real world experience I've had? So I know I've had a few like training sessions, like when I head out into the gym and I can tell like I'm stressed, whether that's stress from outside stuff. I head into the gym thinking, okay, I'm going to go relieve stress in there and take it out on the weights. But once I start training, like one or set, two sets in, I'm just not mentally there and things feel off. And back in my older days, I would just per- just push through it. Like, oh, I'm just going to push through this shit. Whereas the last few years, I'm like, if I feel like that, I, t- I remove myself from that. I'm like, you know what? I'm just not mentally there. And if I'm not mentally there, I know I'm physically not going to be there. And common sense tells me that just leaves more room for air. So I'd rather be conservative, pull out, take care of what I need to take care of. That's that's causing my outside stress, make that come to peace. And when I come to terms with peace there, then inside the gym is more peaceful for me. And I can perform better, express myself better in there. So that's some of the the things that I tell my athletes. If they're heading to a gym, they're just not feeling it. It's, there's nothing wrong with pulling back because it's like it, I'd rather be safe than than be sorry. Yeah, it's very well said. And I, I think sometimes when I find myself having these conversations, I always imagine talking to the younger me or the younger Jeff where we just are more biased to pushing it too much. But there's also people out there who are the opposite and who aren't pushing it enough. So then we don't want that person to take the other extreme where they say, well, kind of woke up in the middle of the night. Maybe I won't train today because I don't want to get hurt or something like that. And, and just fear of injury and apprehension is a risk factor for injury. So I think it really, and Jeff, this is kind of to your point, is you know your athletes, so you know how to talk to them. It's not just giving blank advice to someone who you don't know their personality type. Uh, So I think that's important because every time I have this conversation, I automatically think of that person who's going to push it too much. Um, But we don't want to get stuck in the weeds either. We don't, you know, we don't want to be overanalyzing everything and then, you know, have have not focusing on, on what we're doing in training. And uh, the, the other the other point with that Eric made with the fire hose into the bucket, um, what that would look like in our workload management model would be something like a car accident, right? Where that load is just instantaneous and it's super, super uh, physiological and our tissues can't handle it. Um, or like getting hit, returning a, a kickoff in a football game. Uh, you know, those things are high impact um, and uh, and too much too soon, basically. And what this this or, you know, kind of brings up is this concept called the envelope of function. Very similar to this seesaw that we're talking about with load and capacity but and similar to Eric, how you were saying is that some of these things started out very simplistic. So a lot of these models dealt with the tissue level and tissue damage and how much can an actual structure take before it fails. So it sometimes started out as that, but now that same concept kind of grew into more of this holistic approach where this level that a tissue could take is kind of in flux. It changes with different things that happen inside the gym, outside the gym. Um, so this, the, uh, a quick, quick story about the envelope of function. Um, back in the nineties, uh, Dr. Dai had this, this idea to, to do an, uh, an arthroscope of his own knee. So basically he makes a little hole around his, his, uh, his kneecap, puts a camera and puts a little tool and he goes in there and kind of looks at his own knee. And what he found was um, he had a lot of cartilage damage on his his kneecap and in his knee. So he thought it was interesting because he didn't have any knee pain. And so then he came up with this idea that maybe it's not so much something physical in the joint that's causing this. Maybe it's something else. And that something else is where this idea of this 
kind of fluctuating line came from, still only talking about a structure, but that it wasn't just cut and dry, black and white. And so he originally made this idea where um, it, it, you take into account load and frequency. So one extreme of high load, low frequency would be something like a one rep max. The car accident example, like I said, um, or like doing like a box jump or jumping off of something high, like one time high impact, that's high load, low frequency. On the other end of the spectrum, we have low load, high frequency. So walking a lot, bike riding, something like that. And somewhere in the middle, you have things like, you know, playing a sport or um, even like bodybuilding training would be somewhere in there. And, and like we said before, the more you train something, the more that line goes up in that area. So a power lifter's envelope of function will be skewed more toward the higher load, lower frequency, and a marathon runner's envelope of function would be skewed more toward the other way. Now, it's important to know because when we push that envelope to, to gain whatever we're trying to gain, we want to keep that in mind. So a power lifter will have, like we're saying, that protection if we're going to push that that load. Um, but if, you know, he wants to try something different or he plays, he plays uh, basketball with his friends over the weekend, he has to remember that his envelope of function is very much skewed to one way, he, he or his or her. Um, so that's where th this concept kind of started with f first focusing on the actual tissue. How much can this actual tissue take? But then now that same concept is, I think it holds water with, with this whole holistic uh, approach that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. It also has some interesting implications. Like once you start to accept that, oh, I don't just have a fixed Eric quality of what my volume tolerance, load tolerance is, because there was an Eric who didn't lift weights. And there was an Eric who had a 1RM squat of 275. And there's also an Eric who has a 1RM squat of 495. And there's an Eric who was benching every day. And there's an Eric right now who doesn't bench at all and is just doing dips and, and, and flies and shit while he does Olympic lifting. So Fly, if what's we... What's shit? Flies and shit. What's the shit? Flies and shit. Just... just... <laughs> 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 wide grip pec deck to get to get some some uh some stretch on my pecs while also getting some 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 booby stimulus you do you do some of these i call these some of these i got i do some of these yeah i do some of these, <laughs> some of these. Uh, <laughs> that's some good shit s-u-m-a-d-e-e-z -E yeah really quick favor guys if you enjoy these shows and have been a listener for quite some time we would really 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 appreciate it if you could take the time to give us a review on itunes stitcher or whatever your preferred podcast app may be having lots of ratings and audience feedback makes our show become more visible across multiple platforms and it supports our mission of helping as many people as we can to be the best athletes coaches and lifting enthusiasts that they could possibly be so if you're not driving and it wouldn't be dangerous, pause this thing right now and give us an honest review over on your podcast app. And we would love you even more than we already do. Thanks for taking the time and we hope you enjoy the show. The, the point being is if, if you have this kind of concept in your head of there's just, here's my amount of load or I, I should handle, you're probably going to very quickly, if even graduated at all, come back to what you were doing previously after an injury. You take time off and you go back to what you were doing. That's what I'm adapted to, right? But if you understand that this envelope of fun uh, function is, is dynamic, that the load and capacity is dynamic, um, that means that when Eric decides he's done doing Olympic lifting for a while, he's not going to go back to benching three days per week. Or we're going to have some major problems. I mean, I, I've, I've changed the structure of my tissues. I have a different range of motion at my joints involved here. Um, so, and I, I, I've definitely lost strength. I wouldn't be able to go back to the same loads. That's kind of the first thing we think of as lifters. We think about the weight on the bar. But the frequency, the volume, uh, the time off, the proximity to failure, all of these things, the position I'm in, uh, I, I need to consider and gradually get back to. So the next domino that falls is going, okay, well, well, hold on. If I get injured, I have an immediate change in my envelope of function. But the problem is, is that I want to get back to the training I was doing before I was injured. So I can't go completely time off or I'm losing that adaptation. And this is where I think 
you start to go, oh, and then like, so what should I be doing when I'm injured? And some of the stuff that I've heard you talk about of basically trying to get as close to the thing, the movement pattern that actually hurts you, but doing it in a way that doesn't hurt you and figuring out what your new envelope of function is so you maintain as much of those adaptations so that when you return, you're much less likely to get re-injured. So I would love to talk of, talk about that, Nick, that, that, that fine balance of your change in envelope of function but needing to get back to it because you're trying to train in the same way but maybe smarter or better load management than what hurts you, which is kind of this catch-22 and where I think a lot of even intelligent athletes run into trouble where they stop training, go back to, to their old training when they think they're, they're in the clear, but they don't realize that in the clear means that shorter sink with a smaller drain. Right. Yeah. And the, um, it's great, you know, great kind of segue into the next part of this, this, I think here, and it's important to also remember that the, so the, the envelope does fluctuate from, uh, Eric to Eric, but it also fluctuates from this Eric now day to day. So that's Mm. important to, you know, it, it even changes. It's, it's even day to day type type changes. Um, so if if someone does develop some kind of of pain where do we go you know what do we do do we stop training do we you know just push through it no pain no gain type thing um and we're going to kind of touch on some topics that that we've we've kind of talked about before but i think it's important to to, to kind of bring up in this conversation and so the idea is that we want to maintain our training effect while not provoking that pain because we want to push it so that we are still achieving that effect that we that we want, but we also don't want to provoke it and and flare it up because provoking it will kind of um, resensitize that system, right? So, like an oversensitive car alarm, we want to desensitize it, right? So if we keep flaring it up, we're going to keep uh, telling it you're right. You know, the pain that you're sending me, you're right. And keep it coming because it's, it's there and it's, it's bothering me. So keep that signal right. coming. The, the more that, that Harley that went by is actually someone breaking into your car. <laughs> it's just kind of the, the analogy, right? But, exactly. wait, but that's, that's the, the, the confusion. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And one of the, the ways that I think of it, a metaphor that I like is like the boy who cried wolf almost. So we have mm. this area call it back pain or, you know, and, and it's, it's this alarm system that's, that's warning you that this area is vulnerable. It's sensitive. Um, it basically it wants you to know that, look, if there is a grizzly bear in the room, I don't know why it, it's always a grizzly bear. Whenever we talk about <laughs> fight or flight, it's always a grizzly bear. Make it a T-Rex. Right now it's shark week. So maybe we'll say a great white shark. All right. Great white shark. We're swimming. So we're swimming. (laughs) So we're swimming. There's a great white shark and our body wants to, wants us to know, look, if you have to fight this thing or you have to run or swim away, don't forget that your back is a bit vulnerable right now. That's basically what it's telling us. And the way that it tells us that is through pain is through tightness, through uh, restricted range of motion, right? So we, what we want to do is show it we want to prove to it that it's okay to move it's okay to do these things that we want it to do so we modify the activity slightly so that it resembles what we want to do so say it's a squat a simple example would be a squat barbell back squat we're going to throw a box behind you and sit down to a box and come back up if that does it, then beautiful, because it's very similar to your goal. We're going to keep loading it, and that's going to keep desensitizing that message. Like the boy who cried wolf, like I mentioned, that that stimulus kept getting sent to the people in the village, and eventually that response naturally decreased. They realized that nothing was going to happen. Um, so that's exactly what we want to do with our bodies. We want to show it that it's okay to move here. Things are going to be okay. And then once that we get used to that, once that becomes our envelope or our balance of load and capacity, then we push it a little bit. So if we're doing four sets of a box squat, say, then maybe we do one set without the box and three sets with the box. So we're just pushing that envelope a little bit into that area where we're, we're kind of exceeding it. And we're always checking how we respond. 
And then, you know, depending on how, how that goes, then we kind of, you know, modify and, and go from there. But it's also important to give it enough time, right? We don't want to mm. just, okay, here, we're going to try taking the box out for one set today. You ready? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, you go in the gym and you're so focused on your back and you're like, all right, this is it. Like, if I don't feel pain, then I'm ready to go to the next step. And then all of a sudden you feel pain and then it starts getting your head, oh, I'm not ready to, to progress and I'm never going to squat without a box. You know, it's these things take time and we can't make any decisions just by one training session or one attempt at a progression. I've shot archery my whole life and one of the, I've learned a lot of things from archery, but one of the things that, that, uh, that you do in archery is if you are... Um, looking to adjust your sight or if you want to um you know change change something with your sight you don't shoot one arrow and if it goes to the left okay let's adjust the sight now because we went to the left you need to shoot one two three rounds and you need to get a group like this with your arrows to the left because then we have enough data to say okay now it's time to move the sight and then bang we should be right in the bullseye but something like archery is similar to what we're talking about here because there are so many moving parts to pulling a string back and letting it go. Different from like firing a rifle, the rifle has a, a mechanism that it goes through. You pull the trigger, step one, step two, step three, it's a machine. It does the same thing every time. We're not machines, right? We're, the way that we function is not a machine. More like a bow and arrow where if the wind is just moving, you know, blowing a little bit uh, to one way or... Or if I if I drop my arm or something, or if I pluck the string just a little bit differently, or or I you know I, I change the way that I'm tipping my head, all of these things can impact the flight of the arrow. So that's why it's important to get some consistency before we go make a change in the sight. So that's one thing that I've been finding, especially working with with strength athletes, is once we go take that step, and I get feedback, and maybe there was pain, okay. Let's do it again. Like, let's just try it again. Stay the course. If it keeps flaring up, then we'll change. Um, then we'll change from there. So um, that is, oh, the question was, what do we do once we feel <laughs> that pain? Um, so that's basically, uh, you know, how I like to look at it is that we want to modify the activity, keep it specific to what we want to do, because that capacity that we're building, like we said, is specific to what we want to get better at. Um, so we want to modify that activity specific to what we want to do, load it in a way that doesn't provoke the pain, so doesn't uh, reinforce that 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 alarm system, um, but instead desensitizes it. And then judging by the response, we kind of progress in the same stepwise fashion that we went to regress. We would then progress ideally in the same way going back uh, going back up. Mm -hmm. When do you determine when like? let's say you just can't get this person to function like they used to function. Like, how do you know when that is? And, and how do you know when to kind of, okay, we need to go to plan B, maybe other movements and things like that to accomplish a goal. Yeah, it's a great question. And that also brings up the point that these, this is very imperfect. Um, does it not always work out? Is nothing, this isn't like a, this isn't like a gravity, the law of gravity. This is, um, there are times when it does not work. There are times when we try different things and then that's when we consult with colleagues or we we kind of dig deeper and try some different things. But yeah, Jeff, that's that's not an easy situation and um but but it definitely happens. And and I think the I think a, like a, from a like from for our sport, like bodybuilding and powerlifting, for powerlifting it's almost like okay, there's not too many alternatives you have to squat bench and deadlift whereas a bodybuilder you have you know other movements you can do that can accomplish the same goal so i guess it's more specific to the certain endeavor that someone's partaking in as exactly. far as our sport is concerned exactly yeah and bodybuilding is much easier to work around these things than something like powerlifting and then that brings into the conversation of what what is the goal here? Are is the are you are you going to uh, compete at the world level? And are you is this your year to to break the world record, or are we kind of building up to that point, or are we at the end of a career? That all is going to de de determine how we do this. Because if it's someone 
who is in their prime, they absolutely need to compete. Then we say, all right, maybe we'll train with those modifications, we'll load them, and then you know we'll bite the bullet, push it through the competition, and then see what we have after, and hope that we have built up enough resiliency uh, to to you know to do that. Um, my my mother is actually a pretty good example of this. Um, she was training for a marathon uh, a couple years ago, and I mean she literally would get up and run like. 18 miles on a weekend and I don't even drive that in a week but um so basically she my mom um got into walking got into running lost a, a lot of weight was on this journey of, of running and she went all the way up to this marathon and she had plantar fasciitis in her foot that literally the uh, a couple of days before the race she could not walk up the stairs she was obviously emotionally she, struck she was in tears and she said she worked so hard for this and now she damaged her body and now she's not even going to be able to do this race and what uh what they did was we, she got a cortisone shot in her heel right we got a cortisone shot she plowed through the race she finished her marathon and then we picked up the pieces afterwards and she came to physical therapy and we helped her out and and she's running and walking now just fine um, but that was a decision we had to make. You know, we kind of sat down and said, look, mom, you, you've come this far. I say we just plow through and do it. You know, I mean, it's, it'd be a shame to to waste all the, all the training that we did here. Actually, funny story with that real quick. Um, she, we adopted a, a Weimaraner, a dog. It's like a hunting dog. He was kind of out of shape and, uh, and, and heavy. And she started walking with him, running with him. And, and my mom never ran before in her life. Anyway. Over the course of months and months, she started running more and more with this dog. The dog got in great shape. My mom got in great shape. And the dog was like 13, so he was up there in age. And the day after the marathon, no joke, the day after the marathon, the dog died. Um, but he, uh, so it was kind of like he watched her all the way up to, to that point. And then after she completed the marathon, he was like, all right, peace. I did my job, you know. Uh, so just a... Fun little story there. Uh, I guess maybe it's sad, but it has a happy ending, sort of. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so Jeff, I think that's, you have to kind of take that all into play. What kind of career are we talking about here? Can we afford to take some time off and kind of control, alt, delete the system and see if we'll be in a better place after that? Um, but it's not always easy and it really is important to know, you know, know the athlete to make that decision. It's funny. Um, you were talking about the, the different demands of different sports. And I sometimes laugh because theoretically, I've basically done things backwards. You know, um, in an ideal world, you start Olympic lifting when you're a, a young kid. Uh, and you're probably going to peak in your early 20s, mid 20s, maybe late 20s, um, when you, have you haven't yet degraded your capacity to produce power. And you haven't yet lost some of that mobility that, that, that is more common in youth. Uh, and then from there, you go, all right, I'm retiring from Olympic li lifting. You know, I, I hit the peak that I'm going to hit. I can still do the movements. I love it. It's great. But competitively, unless I go to the master's division, I'm not going to be as good as I was. And then you go to powerlifting and you got like another 10 years, you know, um, because speed is no longer an issue. You don't need to be that mobile to do these movements. And we see people even in their 40s and 50s who can still... Uh, improve on on the core fundamental lifts and then eventually you just can't get stronger you got joint injuries or, or what have you all this heavy pounding but you can still find a way to load the tissue and maintain a really good physique you know you know you could do some more accessory work build muscle and nerves you have it, and then you retire with bodybuilding i did the opposite of that started with bodybuilding went to powerlifting went to olympic lifting and uh as everyone knows, I'm uh, extremely talented in all three. Not true at all. Uh, so the, <laughs> but I, I've definitely experienced how applying these same principles, like you talked about, Nick, to different sports looks really, really different. So, for example, um, bodybuilding is interesting because you have way more options. There's so many way more ways to do it, um, and it's you're really kind of only limited by your creativity. Like uh, Jeff. Uh, I don't want to like over characterize your training. Like if you feel like you, you can better represent it, then please you feel can, free. But you can talk how I'm an old man and you got me training like an old geezer. It's okay. <laughs> nah, I got you training like an eighties, uh, high volume guy now. So, um, 
But I would say, you know, for the majority of your career, you trained with, in a bodybuilding context, moderate to heavy loads, more from a high intensity background, mostly yes. in like this, like four to 10 rep range, right? Yes, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Relatively low volumes, but high proximity high to failure. Yeah. The heaviest load you can use with good form. Um, and now, now that you're, you're, you're at the peak of your bodybuilding career, a competitive pro, a pro champion, um, top five in worlds at, at your peak. And we're looking to see if we can, we can keep improving. You're finding that some movements for certain joints, certain muscle groups, that type of training causes pain that gets in the way of you reaching this goal. So, you know, we, we sat down, we put our heads together and we said, Hey, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways to make muscle grow. And now, you know, we're shifting towards using cumulative fatigue to get, you know, that, that hypertrophy. We're using some BFR, we're using high reps, uh, you were using movements that, that limit load, you know, instead of an overhead press, maybe there's a lateral raise, just many examples you can think of. Um, and that's great and all, but when we talk about a power lifter, for example, like you said, you still have to squat. We can, we can modify tempo, we can change load and do higher reps. We can get almost everything, but when it comes down to it, if you want to keep doing powerlifting, you will have to do a one RM. So I don't know, Jeff, if you want to talk about your experience with bodybuilding, and then we can talk a little bit about my experience with strength sports when I've had injuries. Oh, my gosh. Where do you want me to start? <laughs> How's it been lately? It's sh shifting to the, uh, the the reppiness. Okay, so I'd say the last, what, it's been about six to eight weeks, I think. We've been I think so. going a little higher reps and using some of those tools, the BFR and all that. And heavy for me now, meaning loads, like rep ranges is like, 10 to 15s um where like you said in the past it was four to ten so it still feels heavy enough because you know i'm getting close enough to failure to you know make it feel like i'm doing something and then in a nutshell we've just been balancing out that supply and demand better because i'm still getting the benefits of some heavy training but it's not throughout the entirety of a week it's like early in the week a little heavier back half of the week it's in a nutshell fluffier higher rep that type of thing so what i'm noticing is that i'm recovering a little bit better the joints are starting to have less pain like i could i'd say from a percentage like prior to shifting this training it was like getting up in the morning like i didn't even want to get out of bed some morning like the first few steps is like this sucks and then there's mm. no motive, motivation to train. It was almost demotivating. Like, I don't even want to get in there and do it because it's just going to hurt and I'm going to feel this the next day. So in a sense, what this has done is I've just noticed that, you know, as the weeks are unfolding, I'm starting to feel a little bit better. I'm getting a little more motivated for my training. And I would say I'm probably like 80, 85% back to like full capacity as far as my joints and all that. There's still a little bit there, but considering... The mileage I have on this car, you know, 34 years and probably a good 24 of that was heavy pounding. Um, I would say that that's, to me, that's like, it's, I'm optimistic that I can get really close back to hundred. And it was just having belief in this, the different approach. Like I know the principles, like Nick, like talked about, Hey, if I screw the, screw the screw in to the right, it's, it's, it's going to go in, it's going to be tight. So I know the training principles. Hey, if I'm going higher reps, and I'm applying enough intensity, I'm getting close enough to failure that I'm going to get the stimulus. It was just, it's a hard shift to go from one training approach to all of a sudden now you're training, going to something entirely different. It's hard to buy into that, even though you know there's principles there. So in a sense, it's almost like a behavior shift. And mm -hmm. that doesn't take like one day. It's definitely something that has to gradually happen. And like I said, the more we're doing this as the weeks are passing by, that confidence, that mental confidence is going up because I'm seeing the benefits of it. And I think that happens with a lot of athletes that we coach is like sometimes when you change approach, um, maybe you, you, they think on paper you're doing something that's, let's say, less optimal. Um, but over time, once they get a little more buy-in and they see the results and if it's positive, it's just a reinforcement and it's an encouragement to keep doing it. So that's more or less kind of in a nutshell, how the last, you know, few months has gone for me. So I'm optimistic that even, you know, when I dive into next year, when I get to be turned 50, you know, that this is going to, if anything, keep me in one piece. And even if let's say at 50, I'm not at my all time best, 
just the fact that I'm still training on a pretty high level and I'm actually enjoying it. I'm not in pain. I mean, that right there is just super, super beneficial. So that's my bodybuilding experience. Or lately. Yeah. I think bodybuilding is cool like that. You have a lot of tools at your disposal. I remember I, uh, funny story. Um, if you ever want to get an elbow injury and if you ever want to talk about very quickly surpassing your envelope of function <laughs> and just looking at that carefully balanced load and capacity seesaw that Nick was talking about and just fucking jump on one side, <laughs> what you need to do is run a, uh, a study in a lab where you're loading plates for your participants and you have maybe eight to 12 participants per day and you're in the lab six days per week and you always load it. That's what happened to me in 2016. I was loading plates for eight weeks in Florida um, until around, I think week seven, my elbow just got progressively worse to the point where I couldn't fully straighten it. And it was just kind of like bent always in like a, like a forearm pose position forever. I couldn't bench, I couldn't, I couldn't press. Uh, I also couldn't do a front squat. I couldn't row. I couldn't do much, but I realized that I could do good mornings instead of deadlifts because I couldn't pull off the ground if my, my elbow wasn't straight. Um, I could squat. However, this is back when my hip hip was a problem, so I wasn't really doing squatting. So basically I had good mornings. Um, and then for my upper body, the only way I could really train my lats was like pullovers and because I was like most bodybuilders might think like, oh, my elbows hurt. Can't do back work because that's rows and pull downs. But if you kind of have a better understanding of like how to stimulate a muscle, like, you know, isolation work, you know, which joints need to be involved, which ones don't. And it just gives you a lot more options. But uh, but anyway, I, I just found it an interesting. I had to really think about what can I do. And then once I reframed it to just focusing on what I could do, then I had these carrots to chase and I was... I, I, I got in a position where I was like, oh, these are my new lifts. This is what I care about. Um, a really good example of that is Mike T, who uh, in the mid-teens of, of the 2000s, he had a, a back injury that was preventing him from competing at a high level. And he eventually switched from doing squat bench deadlift to programming around uh, front squat. Um, and let's see, he did front squat, uh, like a landmine press. He did bench, front squat, and I think a row. And I, I might be forgetting what his last movement was, but he basically had three new movements. Um, two of them weren't, weren't his traditional ones, and they became his new programming style, and everything else was the same, and he got really, really motivated and excited about it. And now he's actually back to being able to deadlift and back squat, but instead of just going, oh, I'm super, like I'm healed now, I can go back to that, he's still really, really interested because of the effort he put forth and that reframing he made. And he, I think he's going to keep front squatting until he hits like a 600 pound front squat because that's his focus. So it just gives you the, uh, the understanding that a lot of this is just how you view it. A lot of it is reframing. Um, you know, when we had uh, Quinn Hennock on Iron Culture with you, Nick, he was talking about all the various ways that Olympic lifters might have to deal with this. If they've got pain in a deep squat, they can do power position stuff. They can do work from blocks, you know? So I think ultimately it is just a little creative artistic application of those principles you talked about and figuring out, okay, if these are the movement demands in my sport, what's the closest things I can get to in order to maintain as much of that envelope as function while I do heal or while that, the bed pain subsides while my uh, car alarm gets recalibrated. Um, so I don't know if you want to spend some time talking about what, what, what forms that can take to give our audience more uh, practical applications of that, or if you think there's more concepts they need to understand. Yeah. Um, Eric, when you were unable to straighten your elbow and you were having a lot of pain and you couldn't do much, did you try meditating at all? You know, the funny thing is I was doing a little meditation at that point, uh, mainly meditating on hoping that Hurricane Matthew would not come and destroy uh, Florida Atlantic University and subsequently my PhD and that I had that unstraightened elbow for no reason. But yes, I fully acknowledge it could have all been in my head and meditation would have fixed that uh, chirp, chirp, biopsychosocial model. Um yeah, one of the things before we get into some of the practical ways that this can manifest itself is what I'm what I'm hearing a lot is that a lot of times with experience these concepts we know these concepts somehow 
so Jeff was implementing these before you know uh, he ever knew that there was this was our field in in in, in re- real rehabilitation. And Eric, you were finding ways to do different things, and inherently inherently we have some kind of idea that this is where we want to go down the road here because this is something we're passionate about. And we want to keep trying it. We want we know that we should be focusing on what we can do rather than what we can't do. Um, and it's funny I been doing a lot of telehealth right in the past couple of years and a lot of times if the patient isn't a, 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 a weightlifter or if they don't have access to a gym right which is something that a lot of us now have been experiencing we are always finding things around the house to use uh, that are never before were exercise equipment and now all of a sudden we have something that we can use for for an exercise had a patient water jugs water jugs exactly (laughs) um uh, or backpacks i use a lot of you know throw some water into a backpack flimsy doors (laughs) 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 um so i had an older patient who i was explaining an exercise to and some of these concepts and he said you know what you know who Jack LaLanne is? And I said, yeah, yeah, I know Jack LaLanne. He said, <laughs> Jack LaLanne was promoting this stuff back in the day, like when he had his little TV show and he was saying like, you know, you can use your kitchen sink for this exercise. You can go yeah. to your kitchen table or go to your chair and use it for this, you know, kind of squat. And I said, you know what? I, you're absolutely right. Like this is nothing that is groundbreaking, but I think when, I think what, what happens is in physical therapy anyway, and not to go down this rabbit hole, but I think sometimes we tend to overcomplicate things almost to prove our self-worth. And uh, I think sometimes we lose the simplicity of some things sometimes. Um, not that they're not nuanced and complicated, but just the, uh, you know, the idea of... of um, Do you need to say proprioception to your client? <laughs> like right, that type exactly. of thing? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Like, is, are your hips really shifted? And like, do you really need me to move your vertebrae back in place? Because I really hope that I don't have the power to adjust your spine when your spinal cord runs down a hole that's very tight around your spine. Um, so yeah, just the interesting thought here as I'm hearing you guys talk is that these concepts, sometimes we know already, but, um, but uh, we kind of sometimes overcomplicate them as a profession and uh and then sometimes you have to go back to our roots and it's kind of like a pendulum swing that we always talk about uh, a little bit there but uh yeah so i guess i I would like to share my own experience with some pain uh so i you know the um eric the uh i I know you have the the tattoo of the the milo yes so the idea is that man carries a calf every day as the calf grows the man gets stronger and then over time he'll be able to carry the grown bull right the ba- basic idea yeah Not- it's, it's actually a, a historically documented fact my love croton <laughs> uh carried this uh, baby calf around all the time never put it down yep not too good for the calf's leg muscles probably and his overall development amazingly the calf looks really jacked as well <laughs> when it became a bull <laughs> Um, so anyway, that story is not the same with a baby because what happened was my capacity in my elbow did not slowly increase and increase as my daughter got heavier and heavier. And it's not all her fault, but it's probably, (laughs) it's probably her fault. Are are you saying you got elbow pain from holding your daughter? Well, Jeff, it's more nuanced than that. It's multifactorial in nature. Don't, I don't know if you want to tell this story because all the moms are going to be like, I carry my baby for nine months. So you can't even carry your baby in your arm for however many months it's been now. It's true. I know. I just you, I, I you made a lot of enemies. I, 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 war- I tried warning you, but carry Nick, on. Nick, I got a question for you. Um, did you try meditating <laughs> when... When you had that elbow injury with your daughter. I did. I did try meditating, but the problem was I kept getting interrupted by crying and uh, having, <laughs> having to change diapers. So it's so definitely is, her fault. It's yeah. def- it is definitely her fault one way or another. Um, did you know my mother-in-law <laughs> used, to, used to change Ethan's diaper with 
one hand. That's impressive. That is. But anyways, carry on with your story, please. That's Which impressive. he had to do as well after his elbow injury. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. So anyway, the um, started noticing some some right elbow pain as uh, not when I was training it would hurt a little bit, but more so after I was training. Uh, and I'm going to kind of get into detail here because obviously I'm me, so I know the most. Uh, but I wouldn't. These are the. This is the 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 most you can possibly get from a subjective report from someone who you're talking to. But it just goes to show how much you can get from a subjective. Um, so I was noticing some pain throughout my day, didn't think anything of it, um, and kind of kept training as usual and kept getting worse and worse. And then I realized I had a moment when I went to open my refrigerator and I got this real sharp pain and, and my hand felt not weak, but I just pulled away and was like, Oh, maybe this is something serious. So then I, um, realize, all right, now I have to start doing something about this. I have to start acting and stop, stop trying to wait for it to go away. So what I did was I just kind of analyzed, went through my day and, and kind of thought, when is this thing getting overused and when can I allow it to calm down? How can I change not only, not only what I do in training because we train for you know an hour and change, maybe two hours, a couple times a week, we are using our bodies a lot in other ways. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I was paying attention to that too. So went through a couple of days and started realizing different activities that I was doing that was using this arm and, 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 and flexing my wrist in, in different ways. So I started modifying some activities throughout my day, started holding, you know, one grocery bag in my right hand and then a couple more in my left started not always reaching with my right to open doors and things like that. And, um, just letting this thing calm down a little bit because I just kept poking the bear, poking it, poking it, poking it, started holding my daughter in my left arm um, and and made those slight lifestyle changes at work. Uh, if I was, you know, doing, um, you know, something uh, with a patient, I would try to demonstrate on my left side or, or something like that. And then so I kind of went about that in my my own my own uh, kind of personal life, trying to find ways to calm it down. Pretty much it outside the gym, just trying to find ways to not flare this thing up. And during training, what I would do, and I was limited a little bit because I am training in my basement little home gym, so I don't have five different lat pull down attachments that I can try. So my main vertical pulls were um, a pull up on a high barbell with my feet on a bench. So almost like an inverted row, but like not inverted, kind of just doing a pull up with my feet on a bench. Really the only way I could do a vertical pull. So what I did was um, I added, uh, I just used like a, a hook, a hook grip, hook grip for my lap, for my pull ups. And same thing, my horizontal pull was an inverted row and a one arm dumbbell row. So for the inverted row, I noticed that my pulls on the barbell. To clarify, Nick, when you say the hook grip, you actually mean one of those like wrist wrists with a hook on it? Yes. Those the little vel wrist straps? Velcro hook. You basically just need to touch it with your fingers and it keeps gotcha. you keeps you secure there. Um, so I noticed that when I was doing my pull ups and my inverted rows, I would be, I would use my forearms a bit more than on the dumbbell row. So I use the hooks only for my, my vertical pull and my, my inverted row and the dumbbell row. I kept the same. Uh, and then I changed up, uh, my barbell curl. I was doing a barbell curl. Didn't have, you know, a bunch of different curl attachments, just had a straight bar. Uh, so I, swapped the straight bar out for, uh, I had bands. So I did a banded curl and I had more, some more freedom with my wrists that I can play with, with the bands that felt much better. I was also doing, uh, for triceps, I was doing, uh, setting the bar on the safeties about, uh, maybe like waist height. And then I was doing almost like, um, a reverse, like skull crusher. So I had my hands on the bar, bringing my face under the bar and then pressing it back up. Um, that is quite a bit of stress on the elbow, not bad stress, but if it's hurt, that puts quite a bit of stress on the elbow. So I backed off on that and added just more volume to uh, banded press down. So I 
wrap a band around a beam in my basement and just do my press down movements like that. So I swapped that exercise out and added in some more band work. Um, and what else did I do? I think that was pretty much it on the training end. I was okay benching, didn't change anything benching. Um, and again, getting super specific here just to show how much, you know, my thought process going through this, me being me and experiencing this. Uh, benching was okay. And preacher curl was okay. Didn't change that. Everything else was pretty much the same. So with those lifestyle modifications um, and those changes in my training, I started noticing that this thing was feeling better and better. And it, now like it, daily activities aren't hurting quite as much. I can, um, I was carrying bags of soil today. That didn't hurt. I felt fine. I reached open doors. Everything is fine. Um, so I'll probably ride this out a little bit, but when I'm not just going to stop all my modifications, uh, you know, tomorrow morning, like we said in the beginning, if I do four sets of those pull-ups, maybe I'll do two with the hooks and then two without and kind of ease into it like that always assessing my response to it. And again, I'm not going in there focusing on my elbow and trying to figure out every single thing I feel in my elbow. I'm just keeping it in the back of my mind and making note of it and seeing how I responded as well as keeping track of my sleep and things like that, um, which definitely played a role, definitely played a role in this too. Um, started making sleep more of a priority and, uh, it's funny, you know that you should do that, but then when something like this happens, you're like, all right, I want to really make sure I get all my boxes checked, so prioritize sleep a little bit more, and I've been having a good response uh, with that, um, so that's kind of where I'm at now. I'm still using those modifications, but I'm going to start tapering up from those now, um, but it's kind of cool. I don't ever want to have something like that, but it's kind of cool to actually implement that these concepts and these principles on myself. And I know it doesn't always work out this nicely, and it may flare up, you know, it may flare up for one reason or another, but I understand that that's all part of the process. So how do you, mm -hmm. how do you identify the root cause? Like, what's actually the cause of it? And once you modify and get back to, let's say, full health, do we want to go back to what we we're doing prior and have risk of that root cause flaring up again? Or do we do something like just stick to something completely different. So that's, that's kind of more or less like for me, like some of the stuff that I've dealt with personally with, with aches and pains, I'm always trying to think about, okay, where was the root cause at? Let's not try to repeat history or am I wrong in that type of thinking, or there's just more context that I need to be taken into consideration with that type of thing. Yeah. I think there's more context and I guess, it depends, but what does it depend on? I would say it depends on the type of pain, the type of symptoms that you're feeling. So if every time you do a certain type of movement, say for me, for example, if every time I tried to do that pull up or an inverted row on rep number two, I got a sharp pain in my elbow, then I would probably say, all right, we got to really make sure that is this movement really the right movement for me? Um, but and if if even with the modifications, if it doesn't work, um, then maybe it's it's time to change out the movement. But if if we kind of progress back up in this gradual way that we're talking about, I would have hopefully built up the capacity to then go back to that. Now, the only reason I am going back to the exact same thing I was doing was because I'm limited to my basement. But if you have other options that you could do, then there's no reason why you can't, you know, maybe I'm just not going to do pull-ups. I don't have to do pull-ups. I'll just do pull-downs or something like that. Um, so I think it depends uh, on, the, on, on what exactly, how the symptoms are feeling, how you're responding to the progression back up. And um, there's one more thing I wanted to say. Um, Oh, well, while you're thinking, the, oh, go the, ahead. Yeah, the the root cause. So, I don't know that we can always nail down the root cause. Sometimes it's not like um, it was definitely this or it was definitely that. Uh, so, because it could have been a combination of of many things. Exactly. That led to the, exactly. Yeah. And there's no guaranteeing that if we go back to that stuff, those all those pieces are going to be in the same place as they were when you originally started feeling that pain. So finding a root cause or like 
sometimes we call it like a trigger. Like what was the trigger? What, what caused this thing? Sometimes I'm not as concerned about that. It's helpful because then it'll give us some insight into how we're going to regress and progress and what variables we're going to change. Um, but I don't really like, you know, saying that this was good or bad that you did, or, or, you know, this is something we should avoid, unless, of course, like we're saying, the, you know, the situation calls for something like that. I think it, another way to, to kind of frame that so someone doesn't go like, oh, hold on, you got to know what the root cause is. It's really important. You don't want that to happen again, is just to realize that there isn't always a smoking gun. Like, if you were to go to three different healthcare practitioners with a different focus, or right, let's say you went to Nick, who is, a holistic practitioner who's thinking about load management and he's looking at it from kind of that supply and demand perspective, he'd, you know, look at himself and go, well, Hey man, you just had a kid. Not only is having, you know, a new daughter going to negatively impact your sleep. It's going to take a lot of focus, but COVID's also going, going on like, and you, you, you're training this way and you're also holding your daughter all the time. So you got a physical stress and you also got reduced recovery. You aren't necessarily doing anything wrong, but your situation's changed a lot compared to last year when you're doing all this stuff. And like, oh, that's a good point. But then let's say he'd gone to a someone who was really focused on posture or muscle balance or symmetry left to right, and they noticed that you had slight scoliosis or you know something going on, uh, like that's, that's that they they would see as a risk factor. They might attribute it to that. You know, like for example, if if Brad Loomis gets hurt, and let's say he didn't know we had extreme scoliosis, now his is bad enough, you can just see it looking at him, but let's just say it wasn't that bad. So I'm going to go, oh, the cause is scoliosis. Well, maybe, maybe not. You know, why didn't he get hurt yesterday? Like he, he had a scoliosis yesterday, you know? So I think it's, um, it's something we get when we think about contest prep. You know, it wasn't necessarily whatever you had in your refeed day that made you binge. It might have been six months a rough day at work, you know, a, a yeah. hard phase where we, we pushed you five low days in a row or something like that. But, um, I think that's, uh, it is always our natural tendency is cause it, it's, it's empowering if you can identify the cause cause then you can fix it. Um, but I think probably the supply and the demand metaphor that you talk about, Jeff is, is, is the most useful thing. Uh, that said, Nick, correct me if I'm wrong, if someone does have an old injury or a specific feature of their body which leads them to have a known weak link, you can expect that when supply and demand aren't balanced or when load and capacity aren't balanced, that might be the thing that goes. I remember my neck used to get repeatedly injured and it was always in a cyclical fashion which kind of lined up with when I had the most stress in my training program. And it was on the background of me doing a PhD. So, yeah, there and you go. Anecdotally, we've uh, there are situations where people will have some sort of lingering chronic type pain that comes and goes, good for a couple of years, comes back, and then so let's let's say elbow pain, right? So let's say I have this I have this elbow pain, and um, then five years down the road, I drop a plate on my foot. Now, my body has this stress response, the pain response. Sometimes what will happen is I'll start developing that elbow pain again because the body oh. remembers that, right? So the body remembers that spot. And similar to the shark example or the grizzly bear, right? It's like, hey, if we need to fight or flight right now, don't forget that five years ago your elbow hurt. So we have to protect this area if you're going to fight. Um, I don't know too much research on that, but anecdotally, um, we've heard stories like that and um, how that that body kind of remembers that vulnerable area. And um, it uh, really goes to show just how interesting and nuanced this whole pain experience is. Um, but yeah, so if you do have some kind of lingering issue that, that you've been hurt before, one of the leading cause, uh, risk factors for injury is previous injury. So um, just don't get hurt and then you won't be at risk for injury basically is what we're saying. Excellent take on um, advice well, for everybody. Yeah, yeah. So, so even <laughs> but, to this uh, day, like the fear of like when I train calves, I, I don't care how much I try to block it out, it's it's always there. Anytime I do a calf raise, it doesn't matter if it's the same exercise, different exercise, no matter what loads I'm using, it, I'm always thinking about don't make a wrong move. Because I have that fear like it's gonna happen again. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Yeah, and and that sometimes that's that that could be a good thing, right? It could be protective, depending on how severe it is. If you're super apprehensive and it's really limiting you, and you're doing something like you're you're playing football or American football, and you're apprehensive of pushing off that side, well, if you catch a pass and now you are you're going eighty percent effort when you land on that foot because you're afraid that's gonna you know affect all the way up the chain. And then that could lead to some issues. But if we're doing a controlled calf raise and you're just, you know, you you remember that feeling of that when you felt when you, you tore your calf and that's not so much, you know, I don't think is going to put you at risk or, you know, someone in, in a similar example at risk for re-injury. Um, but, uh, but yeah, definitely if if you do have something that has been going on or that kind of comes and goes or is, or is chronic, it's hard not to think about it when you're doing things like that, but sometimes it just flares up sometimes for, for no reason directly related to it. And then things like scoliosis and things like that, um, you know, it, 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 not that it's directly gonna, going to put you at risk for injury, but it, it could have some like secondary and tertiary effects too. Mm-hmm. Nick, let me ask you a question. So Obviously, physically, there are known variables that a unfeeling human uh, could, a robotic-like human that that we know we're not, uh, could could change. So, for example, and I'm sure there are more because I'm not a physical therapist. I don't live in this world think about it a lot. But through the various injuries I've had in my career, I've thought of, you know, I can modify the movement pattern to something similar or quite different. I can modify... Uh, the range of motion, which is kind of the same as a movement pattern, but, you know, a squat versus another squat that's just not as deep as, you know, or you don't come all the way up sometimes or whatever. Um, uh, or you don't perform the eccentric or, or something like that. There's, there's a lot of ways to think about modifying the same movement pattern. Uh, or you can change the tempo or you can change the load. So those are kind of the things that, that live in my head. Now, obviously, if you, like I said, if you're a robot, you could go, okay, what can I do? What's the least amount of changes? Like let's say I'm a powerlifter, I'm hurt and load is a limiting factor. I can have a day where I, I let's say load at full range of motion is a limiting factor, you know? Okay, I can have a day where I go heavy, but I cut depth. I, I do pin squats. And then I can have another day where I go light and I go all the way down. Or I have another day where I go as heavy as I can at a low tempo and then I, I go all the way down, so I don't have to do a ton of reps, even though really you're doing a ton of reps with a low tempo. It's just slower, right? Um, so that's great. But like if you are a power lifter who has a similar mindset to Jeff after that injury and you find that certain one, of those, some of those exercises are just emotionally traumatic almost to try, how often do you find in your practice or how much would you, you recommend that, hey, the variation you do should be the one that scares you the least to start? Like that might be the path of least resistance. Yeah, it's all about finding that entry point. Like you don't want to, you know, pick something that, right. And that's, that all comes with knowing, knowing the person asking for feedback, not just how did your back feel? How did your hip feel? How did you feel? And one of the things that I like to recommend a lot is sometimes we need to go down to very, low level exercise so we're talking like a box squat with just the bar and we're not even counting it to volume like we've swapped out the squat for for a leg press but before your leg training we're going to do squats with the bar to a box what i cue them or what i what i remind them to do is when you step under that bar with no weight on it and the box behind you i want you to imagine that it's a loaded barbell I want you to imagine stepping up to that bar, getting under it, planting your feet like this is going to be it. This is your squat. Feeling the the coolness of the bar in your back, feeling it in your hands, bracing your upper body, bracing your midsection, right? Feeling your feet on the floor. I have them go through this whole mental practice of what that squat is going to feel like once we build up to it. And... um and because that that really helps kind of get the mind right for when we're ready to kind of progress back up. It sounds almost like exposure therapy with someone who is trying to, who's like, you know, either OCD or has had PTSD and, you know, they hear a firecracker and the next thing they find themselves feeling like they're, they're back in a war zone. 
Uh, it's all right. Let's let's imagine a firecracker going off and going. Okay, this is a firecracker and getting some lower level of emotive response. And like you said, the boy who cried wolf, it becomes lesser and lesser and lesser and more and more manageable. I. It sounds like what you're asking someone to do is, hey, this is you. You know, cognitively, this barbell to a box unloaded is not going to hurt you like that 300 pound squat did. But we're going to imagine it's that 300 pound squat. So we can really kind of convince that car alarm to be just a little less sensitive as we're healing. Is that, is that an accurate kind of description of what you're talking about? Yep. A hundred percent. And we have uh, good um, evidence to support that. And I remember one of the studies from back in PT school, they had um, one, one group, they had to do this task where they, they threw a ball into a cup or something and they had one group imagine they were doing it and then another group control group doing something else and they actually showed that just imagining doing that movement they improved their performance and um michael phelps has said that he he uses this too like he'll just lie in bed and think of every situation that could possibly happen that can go wrong in a race and one of the i don't know world records or something that he broke as soon as he dove in his goggles fell down his face and he said that he had replayed that moment over and over and over again in his head so much before it ever happened. He never even knew it would happen. But when he dove in that water and his goggles fell down, he, he knew exactly how many strokes, how many, you know, how much time it would take to hit the wall, come back. And, uh, you know, I don't know how much of that is just because Michael Phelps is Michael Phelps or if it's because he was mentally preparing for it. But it just goes to show that there is value in that mental um, mental practice when it comes to these things. And the other thing that we should mention is, so we talked about a pendulum. And so we're, you know, talking about uh, taking these movements as a whole and modifying the movement and getting back to, to the movement that's that movements that we want. And I guess the idea is, you know, start at the highest level and kind of taper down, taper down, taper down until if we really can't do anything, then we do like something like a bridge or like a leg extension. But we can't always just swing to one side because then in comes the tendinopathy research where sometimes, or even like ACL research, sometimes you want to do those isolated movements. And Quinn touched on this too, Eric, in our Iron Culture podcast. And we, uh, you know, the the direct isolated um, uh, training, and that has benefits sometimes. Sometimes we just want to hit that tendon that is having that, you know, having that pain. If it's a patellar tendon, right, pain in the front of your knee, sometimes a wall sit is exactly what you want to do because you're just hitting that quad. Sometimes a, a nice slow knee extension is exactly what you want to do. Um, so don't get us wrong here you know sometimes isolation work is is what you want to do and and that that is where you want to kind of consult with a professional who can kind of tease those things out and kind of guide you on the right path because you sometimes you don't always just want to do these things on your own you know if you do need help that's where you know we can come in to you know to help you out absolutely I think that's that's really well said, and I think that clears up a lot of things. Um, yeah, so it sounds like based on some of these principles you've talked about, kind of the, the first thing to realize is, yep, you do have pain. There may or may not be tissue damage, but you can't do what you want, uh, at least pain-free. Um, but not doing what you want will reduce the envelope of function. Some of that's unavoidable since you can't do it. But what's the thing closest to what you can do? And maybe it needs to be contrasting on different days like the example i gave of you go heavy with partial range of motion and then you do tempo or or full range of motion really light on another day so you're still getting all the same things of a full range of motion heavy squat just not all the same time while you heal um but you should probably if you're still experiencing pain or if it's not coming back consult with a professional uh especially uh, because there could be other things to do so i uh i personally learned a lot i found this is really been really helpful for me these concepts and as i understand them better as i've had injuries in my career um and uh I'm, we're seeing the proof in the pudding with with jeffrey right now getting ready to uh take the stage hopefully at his best in, in, at the age of 50 so i think it's a cool topic yeah and the most important thing is that 
much like a journey through bodybuilding is that we don't want to just go through with our heads down and not learn anything. And we don't want to just go through and, and get to the final step and not have learned a ton throughout the way, uh, along the way. So when, just like you said, Eric, you have gone through injuries. Jeff has gone through injuries. Think of how much you've learned about your body, about injury, how things behave. So if anyone out there is hurt, if you are managing through your injury, take a moment to, I guess, appreciate the fact that this is going to be a great learning experience for you. And if you take what you're learning moving forward, that's the best kind of injury reduction, uh, you know, risk management thing that you can do for yourself. So just keep learning as much as you can about your bodies. Um, you know, I'm here to help. We're all here to help. And uh, yeah, don't uh, don't don't miss out on those lessons because they'll make you more resilient down the road. And if that doesn't work, try meditating. <laughs> All right, folks, thank you so much for your time. I hope you enjoyed our discussion of load management and the envelope of function and how to come back to and deal with times where you're hurt. What's going on, 3DMJers? Eric Helms here. Thanks for listening to our podcast. I just want to take a second to tell you about MASS, Monthly Applications and Strength Sport. This is a monthly research review that I put out with Greg Knuckles, Dr. Mike Zerdos, and Dr. Eric Trexler. We cover the most up-to-date, peer-reviewed research in the world of strength and physique sport that's directly relevant to your practice as a coach or an athlete. We provide our reviews in written format, but also, since you enjoy our podcast, in audio roundtable reviews where we discuss the research in depth. Finally, we also do video concept reviews where we cover a broader topic and video format for your learning. For fitness professionals, you can take quizzes on mass content and earn continuing education credits for most of the biggest certifying bodies in the fitness industry. If you want to sign up and get a subscription, head over to 3dmusclejourney.com and click on the products tab. Thanks for your time and thanks for listening.